the Mini-Me Galleys. This is Mini-Me number three, and this is Mini-Me number four. I do have a fifth ProMaster City in my possession, brand new and available for a build. So if you're considering a Mini-Me, reach out and we'll get started. We build these modules out here on the table. I've designed these modules in such a way that we don't, we don't waste any space. Everything is self-contained in the module. And when we're done, assembled and tested, just pick it up and walk it into the van and bolt it in place. This is Humble Road's mass production product. Our custom vans are all different. There's nothing the same in any of those vans, one to the next. The mini me's the floor plan's all the same. You get a choice of wood and colors, fabrics and such. So that's what I say here. I'm doing two modules at a time. Everything I do to that one, I do to this one. And uh, we packed a lot in this little space. It's 42 inches wide by 16 inches deep and 28 tall. It's designed so when you're sitting on the bed, you can work on these, uh, you can wash your hair, make your dinner, whatever you wanna do. Same thing with the bed frames. Bed modules are all made out here on the table. We assemble them to spec, they're all the same. Torque them down, bring them in, lock them into the van. The big push here is access, as you know. That's the way it is with all my van builds. Uh, you got these cute little drawers. Look how cute these drawers are. Now, if you were to simply remove these drawers, which is very easy to do, they're on eight inch glides, you would have access to your inspection hatch. You can see the bottom of the drawer box carcass has this cutout, and then you can get access to your inspection hatch and the fresh tank. Now, if you wanted to take this drawer box out, four screws and the whole drawer box comes out. Now you've got major access to all the components. Here's a really powerful SureFlow DC water pump with a screen filter. Pickup comes right up out of the tank. Now, as I said, because there's a check valve on the other end of this pickup tube, this is always pressurized. There's always water in there. So the next time you turn on your sink, there's no air coming through the line. It's, there's water here and there's water here because the pump maintains pressure on this side. We maintain pressure on this side using a check valve. You've got three zones of plumbing. This goes to the hot water maker, and this goes to the cold water for the sink, and this one is gonna go to the UV filtration system, which is not connected yet. This is an electric water heater, 120 volt, so you would turn on your uh, inverter to make hot water. In terms of, of design and access, if you had to replace this water pump or this water heater, you get a pair of dikes, and you simply cut the two zippies. Once those zippies are cut, this swings out of the way and you can remove your water pump and or your water heater. And when you're done, you just put this back up in place and put two fresh zippies on it. And that's how that works. Oh, one thing about these water pumps. When you're mounting a water pump uh, up on a wall like this, on a plywood wall, for instance, a lot of people, the inclination is to just screw it in with wood screws. I don't do that. Let me take you around the back here. Hold on. We're going for another helicopter ride. See, what I do with my um, water pump mount, I use T-nuts, okay? I use T-nuts and machine screws. And what that does for me is I can remove and replace that water pump easily. And with a T-nut as opposed to a wood screw, you're not gonna shake loose over time. And another little tip, I put one little screw alongside that T-nut so that it doesn't twist out when you're tightening down that water pump. So that's the way that works. You can see right here, I've got a gusset. This is one of the mounting points to the wall of the uh, van. And you can see my access cut out so I can get at those bolts for the future. And that's gonna happen all the way down the line. There are other multiple mounting points on the back of this galley so I can mount it securely and solidly to the van. Here's our end panel. This is the central command panel 
that you've seen in the other van builds. So let me show you how tight some of these tolerances are. You can see how tight and efficient it is where everything plays together nicely, but there's access when you need it. Here's the pickup coming out of the fresh water tank alongside the drawer box. And you can see back in there, you can see those plumbing valves. They're right up at the back of the drawers. There's only less than a quarter inch of space. So that's the way these things were designed, to be very efficient in, in space utilization, uh, but you still have access. You saw that just a minute ago. When the modules are ready, we bring them right in the van and set them in place and bolt them in. We put plus nuts into the side wall for a good solid connection, and then we screw down into the floor. You can see this cutaway in the floor. This is for the water tanks, the fresh water, 14 gallons up front, six gallons in the back. Uh, we cut it away and we put in a quarter inch panel to fit in that spot so the tanks have a flat surface to sit on but we needed that extra depth on the tanks in order to make them fit under the galley. If you noticed when we were working on the table, we have to elevate the galley so that it fits with the water tank. See the water tank actually sits lower in the van than the rest of the module or the bed. The bed sits up on the floor, but we recess those tanks down into the floor to gain the extra height in the galley. And even all of the wood components that go into the Mini-Me build are cut on the CNC machine. This is the command central end panel on the galley in white oak. You could never get this kind of precision and quality and repeatability if you did it by hand with a jigsaw. So when you're, when you're looking at production and you wanna be consistent, uh, the uh, CNC machine is a valuable tool, a valuable tool. All of our panels, these are ABS plastic uh, panels and they go inside the bottom of these galley modules. They go actually live in this channel of the 8020, quarter inch, fits right in there. It's captivated, it's very difficult to design and build the 8020 boxes where you must, you can't put any little corner brackets in here. We call them elbows. You can't put elbows in here because then you can't get your, your panel in. So you've got to figure a way to do all your mounting behind the 8020 and not have it interfere with something else. Uh, but we got all that worked out. Uh, like I said, Mini-Me uh, 1 and 2 took us a great deal of time to get all these details worked out, test them and change them and make them work right. And Mini-Me's 1 and 2 are out in the wild. Uh, in fact, Melissa from Minnesota, she just got back from over a 500 mile trip. She went from Minnesota to upstate New York and then meandered back through Cleveland. She went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and she had a ball. She said she loves that little Mini-Me. Now that she's home, she says she's gonna give me a little write-up on her impressions of the Mini-Me. So when I get that, I will certainly share that with you. <clears throat> Mini-Me number one, you know, that gal bought custom Humble Road van number one, and then she bought Mini-Me number one, so she's got both number ones for Humble Road. Those are collector's items. I'd like to put those in the Humble Road Museum. But she goes from Tennessee to Southern California to see family and back. I think she's doing that every few weeks, once every month and a half or so. She goes from California, Tennessee, back and forth in the Mini-Me, and that's how she's using it. When she gets out there, she takes some little camping trips in the Mini-Me. In Mini-Me number one and two, we discussed a fuel sender access hatch that was located back here in the cargo bay floor area. Do you remember the access to the fuel pump cover in my last Mini-Me video? Well, I have decided to mark off the coordinates for the location and provide a replacement floor piece. My reasoning is this. It is most often rare that a fuel pump should need service or replacement, but it does happen. And during the time leading up to that heartache, why be constantly reminded and live with a cutout hatch right in the middle of your floor. It's not necessary. It's kind of like a life jacket. You keep it tucked away until you need it. The fuel sending unit is accessed through a hatch in the floor back here. 
Well, we decided that the, for the amount of times you might have to replace a fuel sender in a vehicle, I've been driving for 40, over 40 years, I've never had to replace a fuel sender in any of my cars. I had 36 cars since I'm 17. So we decided to make an access hatch in our subfloor, and then we ran our finished floor over it. Now, if one of those two vans has to replace that sending unit, they're gonna have to cut the floor away. We gave them coordinates. We gave them measurements of where that access is. So they would cut away and get to that sender. Then we'd have to, and we even gave them an extra piece of flooring that they could cut and fit back in. We decided that was even too much work. So what we decided to do was come up with a very tight tolerance cover that's already cut into the floor. And there's really only one way to get it out. Easily, that's it. So here's our finished floor. We take this panel off. Now here's our subfloor. This subfloor piece is cut in a circle, the same circle. And we put silicone all around the perimeter because when that hatch is removed, you can see the road underneath. So we laminated the back of this subfloor piece with black laminate, and then we caulked it in, siliconed it in. So now to remove this, you put two screws in here and pop it off. You'd break that silicone seal. You have access to your sender, clean off the silicone, put a fresh bead, put this back, bring this over, line up your your grain marks, and you're on your way. Center it. Uh, right about there, I like that. Okay, you see how we've got equal distance from the corners over? A lot of people say I'm OCD. I'm not OCD, I'm thorough. Okay, thorough, there's a difference. We'll be, we'll be in good shape. Not completely. If I get there, industry day, oh, you know, I'm shooting vans, I'm walking around, I'm looking. I'm not feeling it. My heart's not in it. And I know why. I knew why right from the get-go. I'm spoiled. I spoiled myself. I have been so focused on what's right, what's wrong, what works, what doesn't, building my own van. I can't look at these anymore. I can't do these reviews anymore. And you all know what the hell's going on too. Oh, look how beautiful this is. Where's the furnace? Can we get at it? It's not raining right now. How do we know this thing doesn't leak? Spoiled. I emailed Mercedes. I said, I want to speak to the engineer that designed this mat. I want to meet him face to face. I got a few things I want to discuss with him. This mat. You remember me working with Rivnuts? <clears throat> It was rough. Come on, get out of there. Don't you? I did it again. I burnt them. I can't believe this. The top looks okay, nice and fluffy, just like the, the viewer said. I put the heat down, I got fluffy eggs, but the bottom burned. I gotta work on this. Cholula. Cholula makes everything right in the world. Same as last time, consistent. That's me, thorough and consistent. I think I got hash browns in here and I don't know how they got in there.